Welcome back to the Fourth Way Podcast. Today's episode is an interview with Dr. Alexander Christoyanopoulos, who wrote a book entitled Christian Anarchism, a Political Commentary on the Gospel. Now, this episode was actually recorded like a year ago-ish, and uh, I want to thank Rebecca Mui for the opportunity and uh, and the audio to be able to do this because she had set it up and and invited me, and I was so excited because um, this book was on my my list to read for such a long time, and um, I was I finally read it and was able to talk with the guy who wrote it, and that was that was amazing. So I loved it. So she's given me this audio to be able to to release through this show, um, which was originally released on the Kingdom Podcast, uh, Kingdom Outpo- Outpost Network. So this is going to be slightly different because I'm going to be able to preface this here. Um, it's not just going to be a, uh, a just the interview. I'm going to give you a little bit of um, background and maybe some thoughts before um, getting into the the actual interview. So the first thing that I want to talk about is um, the book, which you, if you've made it this far in the season, you're obviously interested in the topic, and you should definitely go and read this book. Um, it's, it's a great book which surveys Christian anarchism, and it provides a framework of anarchist thoughts and rebuttals from you know, the past couple hundred years or so. And it is a survey, so it's not going to get super deep into the weeds, but it is a very valuable jumping off point. And I feel like I'm at the point where I've more than just jumped off. Like I'm I'm into the weeds a little bit. And it was still very helpful for me because there's so many um so many resources to pursue, you know, based on um, you know, if somebody's ideas stick out to you or some of their arguments stick out to you, there are lots of of resources that you can hunt down through uh through this book to be able to to read more. So definitely start with reading this book. Second thing I want to um, kind of point out, which I think we talk about it pretty early in the episode, but you know, I mentioned in, in my uh, introduction that nonviolence is what led me to Christian anarchism. And uh, Dr. Christo Yanopoulos says essentially the same thing, that um, it was he's more interested in the nonviolent aspect, but that kind of pushed him into to discussing Christian anarchism. And I've heard this from a number of other people, um, but it just it makes sense, right? If you're nonviolent, how can you prop up a system which monopolizes violence? It just seems like it doesn't fit. And so that that was super fascinating to me. The third thing I want to say, which is um, which is going to be a, a bit of a, a, a longer discussion here before we get to the interview, is that it's fascinating to me that um, the nonviolent position and the Christian anarchist position, they contain a lot of adherents who don't necessarily consider themselves conventional Christians and might even doubt whether they'd be considered Christians at all. Now, Tolstoy is a great example of this, um, at, which kind of surprised me when I was reading him because he seems super religious. And then you find out that, you know, he doesn't believe in miracles and maybe doesn't believe in the resurrection. And it's like, how is that a Christian? Like that, that doesn't make sense. And then you start to guess, uh, second guess yourself, like, well, if these are the kinds of people who believe in, in um, nonviolence or Christian anarchism, like... Does that mean that the two go hand in hand? Does that mean that I can't be both? And it's it's very disconcerting. At least it was was for me um, to try to try to work through this. And uh, Alex, which he said we can call him because uh, so we don't keep butchering his name, because um, I have to I have to really focus every time I'm going to do it. And I still I still don't know if I'm right. It's like uh, when I was teaching Mexico City. Um, we, there were actually a lot of a, a large Korean population there, and so they were trying to teach me some Korean words. And every time I'd say the word, it would sound exactly like what they said, but they they just laughed at me because I didn't say it right. And so I'm sure that's what I'm doing right here with his name. I'm sure it sounds like I'm saying it right in my head, but I'm not. So we're gonna go with Alex here and and go with what he gave us permission to do. So Alex explicitly says that 
he doesn't know if he'd consider himself a Christian. That's a little unsettling, at least it is to me, uh, when you're reading a book called Christian Anarchism, right? For those who grew up in, in a conservative area, a conservative religion like I did, or, or who are still in it like I am, this is extremely difficult to grasp. Now, I've long held this idea that there is a fine line with, with uh, Christianity in particular, and you're either in or you're out. Like, you don't, you don't get to straddle that line. And this comes up a little bit. Uh, Rebecca gets to talk about this uh, in the episode when we're talking about patriotism, and she brings up the idea of othering, you know, this idea of an in-group and an out-group and the violence that this can lead to. But what I, I really want to end this preface to the interview with is uh, a question that I was able to ask Dr. Alex at the end after the recording had stopped, because I think that, that this question gets to the heart of what I seek in, in this podcast. So Dr. Alex's book mentions over and over again that many Christian anarchists are rationalistic and don't believe in miracles. While even the more conventional Christian anarchists in the bunch who do believe in miracles, they don't really spend a lot of time at all emphasizing the resurrection, like most Christian groups to do today. I mean, resurrection is huge. That's Easter, right? Um, I mean, it's, it's huge. Yet the Christian anarchist community doesn't emphasize it at all. And so I asked Dr. Alex a question in light of this. And I said, if the resurrection isn't in view for many Christian anarchists, then what's the point of Christian anarchism? Wouldn't Christian anarchism then boil down to moral democracy? I mean, if there's no moral standard, no moral absolute, no essence in which we are purposed to be conformed to, then what is morality but acknowledging the functionality of particular actions and then acting in accord with those actions that do the greatest good for the greatest number? Of course, there are many systems of morality purposed by others, uh, which Dr. Alex brought up in our conversation. And I don't, I don't want to try to give his explanation because I'm afraid that I would, um, I would misrepresent what he said. So um, I'm just going to kind of give you give this this one sided presentation here, um, and you can uh, hopefully um, Dr. Uh, Alex and I can talk again in the future and maybe um, wrestle with this and some of the other questions that I, I didn't get to ask him because it's such a short time and have so many. But anyway, um, I'm just going to kind of give you th this one-sided view. You know, there are a lot of systems of morality that are proposed by other people. Utilitarianism or consequentialism, virtue ethics, or I mean, other sorts of systems that you can conceive of. But none of those systems cut it for me. You know, altruism is, is doing good for someone else because it's good for them. But if I have one of these other ethics, if I, let's say, take a utilitarian ethic, then what does altruism become? It becomes its own antithesis, right? It becomes antithetical to what we understand it to be. Altruism on, util on a utilitarian moral ethic becomes doing something good not for someone else because it's good for them, but doing good for someone else because it's good for me. And I brought up the, the Christopher Hitchens debate, Hitchens versus Hitchens, his brother, um, back in the early 2000s. And in there, there's this, this section where he's brutally honest and he says, look, the reason I, I want to fight AIDS isn't because I really ultimately care about somebody who has AIDS. He's like, I don't want them bleeding and dying on my doorstep. I don't want to get AIDS. That's essentially what, what he says. Like, uh, and then he goes into the Whigs and the Tories and why they started to install baths into apartments and, and stuff like that, right? And it wasn't for the good of the other. It was for the good of themselves. Um, and so on, on a utilitarian system or, or some of these other systems, altruism becomes doing something good for someone else because it's good for me. But how is that altruism? It's not. It's egoism. It's selfishness. It's square circle. A married bachelor. It reminds me a lot of, of Euthyphro's Dilemma. You know, Euthyphro's Dilemma is, is this thing that says, hey, look, good is, isn't really this thing that you think it is. It, it, it doesn't really exist like you think it does. Because is good 
good because God says it's good. So he just decrees it. Well, then it's arbitrary. He can just decree whatever he wants to decree. Or does God command good because it's good? Is there something outside of God that God's like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to say that, uh, I'm going to adhere to this. And then the Christian solution to this is to, to say, well, that's a false dilemma. Neither of those is, is true. It's somewhere in the middle, right? Something is good because the essence of God and the essence of good are one and the same. God doesn't arbitrarily decree good. God is good, and therefore what he does aligns with who he is and flows forth from that. Good and God are, are one and the same. So if that solution is right, I don't do good because it gets me something. And good isn't arbitrary. It's neither of those things. So let's kind of try to try to tie this back in. Just stick with me for a minute, and and I think you'll you'll get it at the end where I'm trying to get get us to here. So in my view, Christian anarchism hinges on the resurrection. Everything that I argue in this podcast hinges on the resurrection. One day, we will be glorified. Or as the Eastern Orthodox believe, they, they call this term glorification. They call it theosis, which I think is a much prettier term. Um, or a deification. I like theosis, though. It sounds cooler. Now, as the Orthodox have a more robust explanation of, uh, of theosis, I'm going to go with, with uh, kind of some of their nuances. All Christians believe that one day we will be like God. We will be joined with God whether that's glorification or you call it theosis or whatever. And it's not pantheism or anything like that. We're not saying we will be the essence of God. And the way that the Orthodox explain this is that they say, we're not going to be God in our essence, but we will be adjoined to him in our energies. Now, what are energies? I don't know. I don't know that the Orthodox know either. But they have to distinguish it in some way, just like veneration and worship. But God, who is good in his essence... Well, one day, through theosis, a theosis which is made possible by the life, death, and resurrection of the Christ, God will cause us to join with him in our energies. We who are mutably and accidentally good will be joined to the one who is immutably and essentially good. And in this theosis, we will be with God and like God. And we will be with God, goodness and good for all eternity. Now, what does this have to do with, with Christian anarchism? Well, it means that the morality it espouses must be tied to the resurrection. We don't adjoin ourselves to the state because they do violence. And that's antithetical to the essence, to the character of God, and to the essence and character of goodness. We do the good, no matter what, not because it works or because it benefits us, though we believe that it does tend to work and it does benefit us. But we do it because we were purposed to be in relationship with God and to have our essences in harmony and community with him. Whereas sin and evil are negations of the good and of communing, to do good is to fulfill who we were made to be. Adam and Eve lost relationship with each other. They lost relationship with nature, and they lost relationship with God in the garden when they sinned, because that's what sin does. And doing good is that which chooses not to sacrifice, but to pursue those relationships, to restore those relationships. Trinitarian communal resurrection theology is vital to any action or system that we pursue. I understand that in this short little bit, that's a lot to chew on, and it might not be a super compelling um, case. But when you think about the alternatives of morality, what's the alternative to God and goodness as the essence and the definition of what we're to be, this absolute? What's the alternative? Is it arbitrary? Or is it really de redefining definitions, turning altruism into egoism? I think this, I mean, I don't know what to call it, but essence or theosis, um, philosophy, morality, I think that makes the most sense 
of all of this. It keeps good as being good, and that goodness grounded in an immutable God, and our pursuit of that goodness as pursuing the purpose for which we were created to be, and not just so that we have it better, a better life than somebody else, but so that we can be in true harmony and true relationship with God, yes, but also with all of creation and all of humanity. Doing good is being in right relationship with all things. Because in him, we're all things made and are all things sustained. To do good is to go with the grain of the universe, to be connected to God. And the good news of the kingdom of God is that Jesus Christ reigns and is inviting us all into that kingdom. And as we live in that kingdom, we share that vision and share that truth with everybody else and welcome them into harmony. So that's a short space to talk about such deep stuff. I'll put a few links in the show notes, which I think might help in some ways. Um, But I I have a feeling that there will be some more conversations about that, uh, or monologues, I guess, because that's what a podcast is for me. Um, So we'll see. So anyway, without further ado, uh, after that long introduction, here is the interview with Dr. Alex, and I'll try it one more time here, Krista Yiannopoulos. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Kingdom Outpost Goes Off Script. Today we are joined by a guest, uh, Dr. Alexandra Christoyanopoulos, uh, who wrote the book Christian Anarchism, uh, Political Commentary on the Gospels, is that right? Yeah. And also uh, Derek from The Fourth Way. Yeah, I, uh, I'm Derek Ryder, uh, like Rebecca said, from, from The Fourth Way podcast, which I started because... Um, I was just trying to, to kind of get my thoughts out on, on nonviolence and um, kind of organize them and, and put them in place so I could go back um, when I needed to refresh my, my memory. And I found myself, uh, as, I, as I went through pacifism, that uh, it inevitably led me towards the ideas of, of Christian anarchism. Uh, the two seemed kind of intertwined and inevitable. So... Um, I was really excited when Rebecca asked me to to come on today for this interview. I'm looking forward to it. Great. And um, Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Alex Christoyanopoulos. I don't know what you want me to say uh, at this stage. I'm a senior lecturer in politics and international relations at Loughborough University. That's the other thing people aren't sure how to pronounce, Loughborough, um, here in the UK. Um, and yeah, I, I did write that book, which was the outcome of the PhD several years ago. Uh, but um, and, and I, I, I think bouncing off what Derek just said, I'm more and more interested in questions of sort of nonviolence and pacifism, but not necessarily rooted in religion. So these days I do a lot of research around pacifism and nonviolence. I'm launching a journal on that, which is very much open to sort of contributions that are embedded in religious studies, theology and whatnot, but not necessarily either. But we might come to, uh, to, to, to this in a minute. I don't know. Cool. And you have a recent book about Tolstoy's? Uh... Yes. That's the other... Um, uh, so I've got it here. That's the other thing that took a while to produce. Um, when I started my research on what would become the PhD on Christian anarchism. Actually, I aimed first to do something on Tolstoy and Tolstoy's political thought. Now, for a range of reasons, the PhD morphed away from that and towards kind of a study of Christian anarchism more generally, although it's really more an exegesis of Christian anarchism or even not even that. It's kind of bringing together the bits of exegesis of Christian anarchism that lots of different people have written and trying to present them as as coherent a whole as I could. But sorry, I'm... I'm, I'm, um, I'm getting fired up now. But so at the time, I was particularly interested in Tolstoy. And, uh, you know, after the PhD, it it took me too long because of all sorts of reasons. But I finally did kind of return to uh, the material I had started on and and, and eventually wrote the book on Tolstoy's political thought because um, there had been, there is still no, well, no book that addresses it the way I wanted to anyway in English. Um, And so, yes, uh, maybe to... uh, 
prefigure a question you might ask me. Uh, I don't know because I tend to be asked that, but it's kind of through Tolstoy that I got to Christian anarchism and therefore, or not, I don't know about therefore, but after the Christian anarchism material, I've returned to Tolstoy uh, at least for a bit. But yes. Yes, the I particularly appreciated the book on Christian anarchism because it was a synthesis. Like you have Tolstoy, you have a little Jacques, a little, and then you you know you have these bits and pieces. But no one had yet before that I think actually created a a coherent sort of synthesis of uh, Christian anarchism as an idea across these various authors. I mean that was my impression. Yes, I. I I guess, uh, to, I don't know if it's to come clean, but to confess, I mean, you know, I, I'm not someone who had much of a religious education to begin with prior to the PhD. I got interested in religion and politics for a range of reasons when I did. And uh, coming at it uh, um, as someone who already was interested in questions of nonviolence and pacifism, I got intrigued. I mean, there's a, there's a sort of anecdotal story to it, but I'll skip those details. But I guess basically got intrigued by the idea that Jesus could be treated as a political theorist or as a political philosopher or something like that. And and when when I was quoted, you know, passages of the gospel, which uh, most of which I had heard, but I wasn't particularly, you know, um, versed in it at, at the time. I thought, OK, this is really interesting because if it if it is political, then it's rather pacifist. And if you take it to what would seem to be its coherent logic all the way, not to the extreme, but to, to, to the conclusion of it, then you'd probably reach an anarchist conclusion to the extent that the state uh, is a violent actor and so on. And that around then, I don't know, I can't remember exactly when Tolstoy was mentioned to me or if I, at, that, at which point that ingredient came in. But that's when I stumbled on Tolstoy, who of course is someone who does exactly that. He, you know, um, argues on some sort of, okay, awkward Christian foundation that uh, Christianity amounts to or should amount to um, pacifism or, 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 or uh, a rejection of violence and on that basis also rejection of the state. But Tolstoy is also frustrating because there are a few issues which he kind of ignores, which if you want to be consistent, you ought to at least address. So Romans 13, um, you know, render unto Caesar, several other things he just isn't very good at. He tends to ignore or dismiss a bit too quickly. And of course, he has this very rationalistic understanding of Christianity, which most Christians don't necessarily relate to. So he's he's almost kind of a hindrance to his own message, uh, to, for some audiences anyway. And at that point, I, I uh, realised there were many more. There's Elul, Eller, um, Dave Andrews, the Catholic workers, and, and plenty more. And reading them in closer detail, I realised actually these voices complement each other quite well, because where one is stronger uh, but, 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 but weaker on other things, another might be stronger on those weaker sides. And so the PhD became... I think as I put it in there, kind of weaving together the loose threads of Christian anarchist exegesis, and I should have stressed that it's really, I think, largely an exegetical uh, endeavour uh, in, in the book, um, together to present as coherent as possible an exegesis of, of, of Christian anarchism, basically. So, yes, Tolstoy is really, I mean, he writes really well, he's really exciting, a little exciting is the wrong word, interesting and, and provocative and I think he moves you in a number of ways, but he's also got his problems. And, and I think these other voices um, help complement the Christian anarchist thesis a bit, a bit more. So uh, one of the questions that I put down um, is, what would you say uh, would define Christian anarchism uniquely from other uh, political theologies? I guess uh, one thing is the kind of unequivocal critique of violence and rejection of violence. It's not that it's the only theology that does that, and of course there is uh, pacifist theology for that matter, but, but, but it's so unequivocal that it also dares to question the violence that we take for granted as apparently agreeable and consented to by everyone, which is the violence of the state. Or should I rephrase, the violence that human beings inflict on one another through the state or in the name of a particular fear out of which we empower the state to inflict that violence. And that's violence which is both direct, you know, um, if you've been to a demonstration, you would have seen uh, how things can get heated up and become genuinely violent uh, you know, in terms of police repression. We could go all the way to kind of, you know, prison and so on. But there's a structural violence as well. And, and the policing of a status quo that is unjust um, through the violence of the state and the, and the threat of violence. Now, I think that commitment to 
a rejection of violence. I'm not saying, saying non-violence. I think that follows. But a, co a commitment to rejecting violence is something that uh, most Christian anarchists hold to dearly. There are exceptions, but yes. Um, as a result of that, a, a willingness and openness to critique the state and, and, and the options of working through it to try and ameliorate social conditions, that's kind of rejected. And I think there is also maybe I don't I've, uh, maybe I don't play that up enough in 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 the book, um, but I think it is a consistent theme through many Christian anarchist voices. It's a critique of idolatry, so uh, a critique of I suppose human politics as a form of idolatry and of the state as a form of idolatry. I mean, and uh, Elul goes into that, and several others. I mean, Eller as well. It's not a big thing for Tolstoy, for example, but I think it is an important theme in the Christian anarchist voices. Uh, I've come across and I've come across through many more actually since the book uh, so yes I think th those would be th the core things now none of these things are necessarily only the purview of Christian anarchists but I think that's th they're big for Christian anarchists they're important um, and, and they kind of define it as a, a particular strand of maybe a form of liberation theology hmm so you would categorize it as a variant of, of liberation uh, theology? Classifications. <laughs> Us academics can spend endless time you know, debating classifications. I don't know. I'm, I, don't, I don't want to force a particular classification on things. I think it's, it's kind of up to people how they want to use terms to some extent. Uh, but I think there's, there's, there's a logic to it. So if I go through it, the, the slightly longer route in sort of secular um, anarchism, socialism, Marxism, left-leaning thinking and ideologies, you know, there is, there's a strong view out there, it's not the only one, but that, that you could treat anarchism as a form of socialism broadly confined, broadly defined, sorry, although others will say socialism is a kind of moderate version of precisely what we reject, we're more, which much we're more radical, we're anarchists, whatever. But, you know, many of the traits that anarchists classically understood, so excluding anarcho-capitalists, which we might come to later on, um, are basically very similar to socialism, just with that commitment to question the state and other hierarchies of domination, I suppose, a bit further than socialists might be willing to. So if you accept that argument for kind of secular um, ideologies or secular anarchism, secular socialism, then I don't think it's that big of a leap to make a similar argument about theologies of liberation and, and Christian anarchism. As in, of course, liberation, liberation theology is originally a particular movement that, that grows of a particular, out of a particular context, Latin America, but it's since then adopted all around the world in all sorts of different kind of contexts uh, and articulated in, in, in slightly different way as a slightly different theology of liberation using the term loosely. Now, I think it's not incoherent to argue that Christian anarchists are seeking some sort of liberation emancipation from well, again, there is definitely the kind of the political economy of today. So that would be the sort of Marxist analysis that liberation theology might sympathize with. But but they'll they'll take that all the way to, to, to the state as well. And so it's it's a it's in a sense a theology, certainly an exegesis in the, to the extent that I've looked at it um, of liberation of some kind. But, you know, I'm certainly I'm willing to concede that that's not the only way you can skin that cat. And you could possibly that's a horrible, horrible expression. But um, it's you know, you, you can you can argue that um, liberation theology is a tradition of its own and, and I don't think many um, Christian anarchists that have I suppose that have published the stuff that I've written that I've read um, I'm not talking about people active today more generally the broader movement but I don't think many of these kind of published Christian anarchists would necessarily associate themselves with liberation theology but that's also because many of these voices emerge prior to liberation theology so it's debatable but I think you can make a case for you know treating it as part of that broadly defined i think interesting because i've read i've read critiques like uh, hebden hebden would like strongly be like no it is not liberation theology <laughs> liberation theology is like causing dependence on the yeah, state but anyway but that would be a disagreement precisely um, on that in the in the same way that anarchists might push back against socialism by saying precisely that we don't go through the state. Uh, Keith is a friend, uh, Keith Hebden. But yes, no, I, yep, uh, fair enough. Uh, I think that's a valid argument as well. I think the point, the point about this is to sort of, mm. you know, in the kind of landscape of, of, what do we want to call them? Do we want to call them ideologies for the minute? In the landscape of political ideologies, you know, there are kind of clusters and families. And I, certainly the, liberation theology and Christian anarchism aren't too far apart. Although what divides what we typically understand as theology of liberation and, 
what you might want to see as Christian anarchism is an important point of difference and it would be this issue of the state so yeah uh, but I, it, not not my job to police those uses of term uh, as much as to notice the interesting kind of overlaps and, and, and tensions yeah it's it's interesting to be uh, Derek, you have a yeah question? i just wanted to to make an observation about one of the things that that you said that kind of clicked for me um i, I don't know what politics is like where where you guys are but um, in the States, it's, it's insane um, at, at this point in particular. And you know, when, when you said that, um, talked about idolatry and said that people are able to be critical of the state, I can hear people on both sides of the aisle in the state saying, well, you know, I'm critical of the state, I'm critical of vaccine mandates, or I'm critical of um, non-vaccine, you know, or uh, non-vaccine, non-vaxxers. Um, and but what I was thinking is, I, I feel like when after after reading your book and and um, kind of wrestling with with anarchism, I feel like for the first time I'm ap able to be critical of the state as a whole. Whereas whereas when people say they're critical of the state, they're they're critical of the other idol, the other person's idol, and right. they defend their own idol. They're not really critical of the state. And um, I, I think that's something that, that is clearer to me now that a lot of people can't see it when they're inside the system. So that's interesting and I think it touches on a range of different things. I don't know if politics is as mad here as it is where you, guys, where you are. Uh, we've heard, we, we, we hear you. Uh, <laughs> we pay attention. Uh, your politics matters. Um, it's interesting because yes, I think I think you're right. I, I can I can hear those similar voices um, outside the US as well. People criticizing the state, but coming from a, I suppose a left leaning perspective, they, what they will criticize will be um, a state that polices and forces maintains a, a status quo that is basically you know uh, running a political economy that's in the favor of a, of a, of a limited range of people against a, a broader um yeah against, against everyone else uh, it, it's a state that's increasingly militarized it's a state that does inflict violence it's a state that's kind of adventuristic in its foreign policy uh, and that's not it's not necessarily just the us it might be the uk it might be others too so that kind of state is what you often see criticized on the on the left i suppose and i guess that the state that that um that voices on the right, on I guess the anarcho-capitalist, if that's a term kind of position would criticize, would be the state that they immediately think is somehow necessarily Stalinist and overly interventionist, um, you know, imposing inequality, somehow stifling human creativity and endeavor. I mean, I have deep issues with that analysis. I think it's faulty on a, on a range of reasons, for a range of reasons. But, you know, yeah, I, I, to stick to your comment or question, that's a different state that's being criticized. I, I hear you. I think, I think that's an interesting observation. But I think to try and push it a bit further, and again, that's something I didn't do enough, I think, in, 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 in the PhD and in the book, but it's kind of, I suppose, matured over time in, in my mind and will continue to do so. No doubt I'll think back at what I just said now and think that was still immature in some way. Uh, it's not just the state. I think, and, and this is where it gets complicated, a lot of anarchists will say that anarchism is fundamentally about kind of critiquing, rejecting the state. But a lot of other anarchists will say it, 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 it's really not just that. It's kind of broader hierarchies of domination and oppression. So the state, but also capitalism, racism and the various structures that maintain it and police it. And actually a whole range of things can come in. Um, gender and all that, if you want to go into it. I mean, th th there's all sorts of hierarchies and and preferences that end up favoring particular demographics over others. And I think it's probably fairer to describe anarchism, this is debatable, yeah, why am I doing this? But it's probably fairer to describe anarchism as, as, as a position that is critical of hierarchies of domination. It's a position of non-domination. Some of my colleagues have argued this. So it's not just the state you see, and that's important because a lot of the Christian anarchists, are, and Tolstoy for that matter, really is focused primarily on the state. And you do have anarchists who are focused on the state. But many other uh, anarchists, Christian included, will go deeper. And, and it's not just the state, it's kind of the broader status quo that is maintained and policed and enforced by the state, because the state does have a role. So it's not that it, they let the state off, off the hook, but they go deeper, not just the state, if you see what I'm saying. And, and you see, the thing then is, I'm not 
I, I'm wondering how that then, you know, with that in mind, you go back to what we were saying earlier about kind of left wing and right wing positions about the state. Like, I think the kind of left, left wing critique of the state is very amenable to that kind of analysis and broadening because you can kind of weave into this kind of some of these broader struggles against various forms of domination today. The right wing critique, I think, is, is a bit harder because what's basically disliked is intervention in property and things like that, when property is precisely uh, actually uh, easily uh, a, a, a deep hierarchy that's being meant, you know, like fine to own a few things, fine to own you, the products of your labor. When you own acres of land next to a village that's basically deprived of any of it to survive, that's a bigger issue. And that's that's fundamentally the understanding of private property that is being maintained and, pro and, and protected today um, and which the right wing uh, kind of crit criticisms of the state don't address. They just don't like intervention into that. I'm simplifying a bit. Sorry, I got interested. Good question. <laughs> Actually, that's something I've been interested in, in my research. The more I dug into Anabaptism and Christian anarchism, it seems like there is a shift now or at least a gap in the research going away from focusing on high politics and the maintenance of the state to what is like empire mm -hmm. in human relationships in situated interactions um, like post anarchism yeah uh, and there are others look most of the anarchists i've met this side of the pond therefore um are at least as often, if not more critical of, you might call it capitalism, neoliberal capitalism, and the various imperialistic adventures that it tends to ride on, justify, facilitate, and therefore empire, broadly speaking. I mean, that's a term that's yes, coming from Hart and Negri. These aren't anarchists, but it's kind of vocabulary and an analysis that's easily, I suppose, importable into an anarchist analysis. I mean, those are the things that exercise them. and. Um, how much at the end of that analysis you still conclude that it's the state that's the main enemy i i think depends from one voice to, to to the next but generally the state becomes one of several players an important one again because it's 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 the backer of it all like it ultimately to date it's still you know the police that's going to come and enforce uh, these kind of relations and what's backed up by the law or the military rather than uh, private companies at least as yet or if even if there are private I suppose mercenaries they're usually legitimized by the legal order and again there's a backup by the state so it, it gets it gets complicated but I think that, that that for me is when it becomes even more interesting look a lot a lot of what academic analysis or actually um, fair or nuanced or in-depth analysis of most things involves complicating a picture it's really usually things are more complicated than you think and and actually I, I do I do think that most anarchists I've read you know complicate the critique uh, beyond what as we've said just kind of the state to a number of different phenomena and in today's context in today's globalized political economy 2021 and for a while already actually it's to do with some people will call it neoliberal capitalism um, even and that's often what they'll rail against before they come to an analysis of the state even though that's important too if that makes sense yeah neil know that um going to something that derek mentioned and also a question that i had would um what would be some of the possible contributions of christian anarchism today in especially with regards to the christian political climate which the most the, the most vocal one I would see would be, you know, the North American Christian political climate and just the past few years, um, something like that. Like what could Christian anarchism contribute to discourses in Christianity today about politics? No, that's a good question. And look, this is again where I need to, I suppose, complete. First of all, I, you know, I'm not in the North American context. I'm in a context where uh, religiosity, to use that term, isn't as uh, embedded, widespread as, as, as it is in North America. And I'm not, you know, a church going Christian. I'm not sure I am a Christian, if I'm going to be really honest. Uh, it depends how you define it. I mean, some, some people, when I say that, tell me, no, no, you are. I, I, yeah, we can go into that if you want to. I come at this 
as might be obvious by now, uh, from a Tolstoyan perspective, primarily perhaps, like it's the morality that I'm interested in and uh, and and the import of that in politics. Now, therefore, if I do kind of wear a Tolstoyan cap and look at kind of American politics today or American religion and politics, well, let's not mince words. As far as Tolstoy is concerned, most people who call themselves Christians in the US are not Christians. They are, they're simply not adhering by the pretty radical morality that Jesus um, keeps talking about again and again, uh, you know, returning to in both his teaching and in his example throughout the gospel. And that's even the variant that survived us through the various councils that polished Christianity for the empire uh, back, you know, in, in the 300s. So with that in mind, uh, so, I, okay, no, actually, before I do that, to those who will counter argue that a Tolstoyan kind of Christianity is not Christianity anymore because Tolstoy did indeed reject the miracles, the resurrection, most things theological. He's just focusing on the morality of Jesus, as it were. That's what matters to him. To those who say that, uh, I will gladly concede that that is true. Tolstoy has a rather biased understanding. Uh, what he focuses on is just the morality rather than the metaphysics. However, I'd also count, welcome, no, let's just put it this way, I'd invite those, criti those critics to reflect on whether they are underplaying the morality as much as Tolstoy is underplaying the metaphysics and perhaps in, in the process, therefore, kind of ditching what Christianity is supposed to be about. Look, most non-Christians will tell you that the one main thing that defines Christianity is this turn the other cheek. That's kind of the radical message of Jesus, this, this commitment to love and to forgiveness, which goes beyond most other religious traditions in the radicality of its preaching. Well, where is it? I don't see it in a lot of the voters for Trump to, to go straight for that word. Uh, you know, this is the demographic that by and large voted, you know, voted him in. Um, and you know, it represents a rather passionate uh, corner of a very passionate and strained political canvas in the US. As far as Tolstoy is concerned, that's just not Christianity. It's a fake Christianity. It's something that now he might not necessarily blame every sort of so-called Christian for pretending to be a Christian. He will consider that, you know, again, there's a whole sort of history of that happening. The message of Christianity, as far as Tolstoy is concerned, got corrupted the moment Christianity was adopted as the religion of the empire by Constantine. Um, and he's deeply anti-clerical. He's, he, he's, but then in his anti-clericalism, I'm not sure he's that wildly different from the Jesus of the gospel. So, look, I think, I mean, one of the reasons I suppose I got intrigued in, into, by this material to begin with was that it, it seems to preach an ethics, a way of life, both as an individual and the kind of community that you'd imagine of individuals of the sort, that is very different from the one that you tend to see in mainstream Christianity. And it's one that's kind of really inspirational, uh, radical, sacrificial, uh, almost, yeah, okay, utopian, if you want to use that term, we can discuss that too. That's, I mean, that's an interesting term for that matter. Um, but it's not the one that most self-proclaimed Christians adhere to. It's something they prefer to underplay in a way Tolstoy discusses as well, and, and as do other Christian anarchists. And so how would I see a kind of possible contribution or how would a Christian anarchist kind of judge all those contexts today? They'll be more interested in the more, do you want to call them progressive Christian voices, denouncing neo-colonialism, imperialism, empire, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the various uh, things that the state does, they'll be critical of nationalism and patriotism, they'll be allies on issues around discrimination, repression, injustice, they'll emphasize the enacting of the teaching of Jesus, however nuts it seems, even if it means carrying a cross, which, you know, he did warn about, and that's all very different from, you know, going to church, however often you want to go, and reassuring yourself that God bless whatever country you're in. Yeah. Um, Derek, you had a question that was similar, uh, somewhat related to that. Yeah, so I, one of the questions that um, I guess the one I'll pick for, for now is, uh, you know, when I think of Chesterton, um, who, I, who I respect a lot, but he doesn't have, have much good to say uh, about anarchists and such, at least the, the anarchists that he's thinking of. Um, one of the things that he talks about is is patriotism, and sometimes I feel like 
as I've moved towards the anarchist position that I'm, I'm kind of just really a, a pessimist about everything. Like, oh, you don't do this, and that's, you know, supporting the state. And, you know, July 4th, like, uh, you know, get rid of it. Um, but Chesterton talks very positively about, um, about uh, patriotism. And so he basically, you know, he argues that um, the issue, it, it's kind of, it's wrong to say that you can't take a, a generalization and make it a specific. Like, you know, I love all mankind, but I can also love the United States and have a special love for it, just like I have a special love for my kids over anybody else's kids. Um, and that doesn't necessarily make it bad. So how does, how does something like patriotism, how does anarchism speak to patriotism or group cohesion? Um, and do you think Chesterton is, is right about patriotism? And, and can we really be a part of a nation and celebrate with that nation? So I'm not, I mean, yeah, good question again. I'm not uh, familiar with most of Chesterton's corpus. I know he's cited, there's a couple of passages that Christian anarchists like to cite, uh, but I hear you and no, those kinds of arguments you hear through Chesterton or not. Again, I think the answer has to depend on definitions to some extent. What do you mean by patriotism? If by patriotism you mean community, then that doesn't necessarily sound bad. And I can, you know, I, I can see, look, it makes, what is, I forget the study that ultimately we only really relate with 150 or so people in, in our surroundings, at least at any one time. Like you, you don't know most of the other people who you might identify with, who might be similar to you, but live further away from your networks, geographical or otherwise. So it's fair enough to feel a love and a bond and an identity with uh, the people, I suppose, let's say, closer to you. Whether that needs to be projected onto what is ultimately an imagined community, to use Benedict Anderson's terms, the nation, I'm not sure. So if by patriotism you mean community, then sure, loving your community or whatever you identify with, I don't necessarily think it's problematic for Christian anarchists as far as I can speak for them, and I don't know that I should, but never mind. Um, if by that you mean valuing things not because of their intrinsic value, but because they are ours, then that sounds less promising. So, you know, bearing in mind, and this again would be, I suppose, my analysis, but shared, I think, by at least some Christian anarchists, othering opens the road for dehumanizing. We're all different, and that's great. We're all different, uh, but much depends on what you do with that, whether you I don't, celebrate is too vague a term, but you know, work with it, learn with it, enjoy it. And, and you know, yeah, sometimes there'll be frictions, but, but differences aren't necessarily a bad thing. What patriotism tends to do is it emphasizes those differences. It, it focuses on our history, our common heritage, what we do. And it very quickly has a simplified version of that and equally a simplified version of what those others do. Now, patriotism can be warm and progressive, has been historically. Patriotism in the 19th century was associated with liberal progressive ideas, the patriotism of French nationalism in the 19th century is the patriotism of universal values because we French people have worked it out. So immediately there's a weird association there, that kind of logic. Now, one thing that I like that, uh, to, 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 to again return to Tolstoy, because he was often asked, you know, but surely there's a good form of patriotism. He railed against it. You know, doesn't he think that there's good patriotism? And the question, the, the, the people who asked that typically had in mind, say, the patriotism of the Irish or the Poles or the Finnish, people who didn't have a nation yet, a nation didn't therefore have self-determination, okay, those kinds of human rights, a kind of political act architecture to map onto the land that somehow is theirs or where they tend to predominate. But what Tolstoy liked to point out, and I like about uh, what he says there, is if something's intrinsically good it's good because it's intrinsically good not because it's something that's believed or held by a particular people the north the irish the poles the finnish uh, you know deserve self-determination perhaps uh, but they deserve that because self-determination is a good thing not because they're irish or polish or finnish what's good about our community about the, our way of life is good because that thing is good not because it's something that we do it's good that the, this be done. 
So that's the type of patriotism that I, if you want to call it patriotism by then, that I can sympathize with, that someone like Tosto will have time for, but he won't call that patriotism. It's, it's valuing the things that are good because they're good. Um, so when you commemorate, you know, wars, for example, you know, the heroes, the, the, the brilliant deeds that were done by us lot against them nasty people. Well, it's the good deed that's worth celebrating, which, by the way, we weren't always full of, and the other end, the other side didn't never do either. That's the thing you want to celebrate rather than the usness and the themness. Patriotism skews things. It kind of gives you, it, it narrows your view, and it ends up overly simplifying and and yeah, identifying particular values with particular people. So, community celebration of you know. Uh, things that are good that have been done by I suppose us lot or people in our neck of the woods for a while fine but patriotism when it becomes kind of something that excludes others um, that associates certain values with us uh, as if others can't necessarily subscribe to them or can't translate them and interpret them in ways that are different and interesting in that difference because of a different context then that's a patriotism that I suppose well, certainly Tolstoy or me or quite a few other Christian anarchists would be less fond of does that answer your question? Yeah, and, and I think that's important to note that, from what I understand, you're saying that anarchism doesn't undermine community, which I think is what a, a lot of people would think of anarchism. Um, but it actually it actually expands that community because we incorporate other, and we don't define us versus them. Absolutely, and because of the way, because the way that community has been defined is not restricted to a particular identity, it's potentially open to many, many others, and therefore it is indeed open potentially to the human race rather than, you know, just a particular section of it. Absolutely. So you you mentioned like you know there's originally a lot of focus on the state on um, that aspect of like let's say empire. Uh, what are some mm -hmm. of the main um, maybe thinkers or you know, the main thinking around the concept of othering and of domination and hierarchy between people. Because I, I, I don't think Tolstoy focused on that yeah. as much. So I was about to say the thing about Tolstoy, which is again, one of the reasons he's an awkward client, he uses the vocabulary of Christianity for that. You see, he thinks that, and I'm going to try and use his way of spinning it, when we all become Christians, then it'll all be peace and love and all fine, right? So he, his vision is, is, is that, um, uh, let me rephrase it, when he has in mind kind of that, that Christianity has somehow been adopted by everyone, what he's basically saying is that it's, it's when everyone has adopted Jesus's rather radical and loving ethics of kind of caring and forgiving and love and all that stuff, you know, loving your neighbor, being a servant to one another, and in particular, foregoing any violence or any role in maintaining any machinery of violence or consenting to it. Now, that's what he can see that he considers being a Christian. So when we're all Christians, um, that you know, won't happen anymore. We'll be living in a in in a in, in a new Christian era. I'm using I'm trying to using I'm trying to use his vocabulary here. The point about that is it's a very it, it it's very much a contrast from nations as we currently understood them. I think the the promise of Christianity for someone like Tolstoy is that it erases differences between human beings and therefore forms of othering because it's an adoption of a way of life that is embraced in that vision by everyone um, because people are inspired to do so by a few pioneering examples kind of thing. Now, what's bizarre, or I don't know if it's bizarre, but what sometimes hinders the, the understanding of that message uh, as attempted by Tolstoy, uh, is that he's using precisely, you know, language that others, as in he's using the language of Christianity, which we associate with one uh, religious tradition, as opposed to numerous others. But the way in which he uses it, he uses it with that kind of universalistic kind of perspective in mind. So it's, it's, it's not, yeah, I hope that makes sense. But so from that perspective, 
I don't know that there would not be any othering, but you would always be interested in, I suppose, encountering the other, forgiving the other if they harm you, uh, you know, I suppose, lo you know, learning from one another, etc. And, and, you know, envision, again, a, a community in which there is no, all the, whatever othering continues to happen doesn't happen in the way it, it tends to today, if that makes sense. So it's not one that enables various hierarchies of superiority. But what's, but what's awkward about it is, of course, the process to get us there still involves a community that somehow has understood that or you know, behaves in what Tolstoy would see as a Christian way, as, as opposed to others who don't yet. But those aren't treated as inferior or, um, or certainly worth any... Yes, uh, any... what's the word I'm looking for? any disrespect does that make sense sorry i i i lost yeah, myself a bit because that's one of the question that questions that comes up for me like uh both anarchists and anabaptists advocate for some kind of communalism and mm -hmm. the strong focus on the kingdom of god and you're defined it is in a sense it's against othering because it's against what empire does to the other but at the same time it is forming a strong communal identity that does as some critiques of monotheism would say, like exclude the other, which it's which is violence. So it's a, a paradox of some kind that you know that. I agree, but I think it comes with. I think I, th I mean I think you're right. I think, but I think it comes with an openness to the other, which a number of other forms of identity don't embrace, if that makes sense. Um, so there are all sorts of ways of imagining community, society nationhood, identity, um, that aren't necessarily interested in learning from the other, engaging with the other or with others. This is, this is a form of identity that, yeah, absolutely still kind of identifies an us and, and a them, but it's an us that wants to reach out, that out, I guess to some extent, yeah, does want to convert or preach, but it's one that's also open to um, yeah, treating others with respect and forgiveness and, and therefore it's also a way of approaching others that is not going to concede to any form of violence being imposed but then you have the issue of defining violence and of course the, the othering and creating identity is a form of violence perhaps <laughs> it's still not exactly direct violence in the in the way that you know a, a tank does I think yeah it does go around in a circle it does um... a bit <laughs> so yeah, I think it's it, there's a there's a paradox there. You're right, but I don't think it's a it's a complete incoherence or inconsistency. It's an interesting paradox. Yeah, um, actually, uh, Derek had an interesting question about um, Elul and something linked to that. Right. Yeah, if we're gonna go on to that, um, we can definitely jump there. Uh, what, because that was that was dealing more with uh, like social justice, and I think Rebecca and I were were talking um, through questions and talking about abolition and how it's interesting how when you look back you see a lot of a lot of social justice um, before its time before a lot of other people caught on. Um, one of the things from your book that stuck out to me was uh, very pertinent today because when I got to uh, towards the end, you talk about how Elul. Um, was was against compulsory vaccination and i th i think if i remember correctly it came in a seg uh, section of the book where you're talking about social justice and concern for the other and concern for neighbors and it's it's so fascinating that today we have this conversation where you have again the left and the right at least in the states where the left says hey we need to love people therefore i want to force you to have a vaccination and you have people on the other side who say no? You can't. You can't forcefully love me. That's that's uh, impossible. Um, and they refuse to do that because they think they're standing up to tyranny, um, or or whatever else they think. And so I I was wondering if if you would have any thoughts from the the perspective of Christian anarchism of how you balance loving your neighbor as well as pushing back against tyranny. Um, what <laughs> what that might look like in uh in today's time yeah that's a tough one um i do mention it in the book i was looking up that passage 
uh, as you're talking, I mean, this is in, in the section on sort of what to do about the state according to those various voices that I've uh, looked at in the, in, in the book. And uh, they mainly preach things like n not holding public office. They have an ambivalence about paying taxes. They preach, uh, n n you know, refusing conscription and war. But then there's a section where I have to sort of be honest and, and, and mention a few other um, positions. And Elul does, at the time, oppose compulsory vaccination or even compulsory schooling. I mean, let's leave schooling aside. I know that in France there has long been an anti-vax movement. It's quite embedded and it's, you know, you, it's been visible with COVID, but you could see it coming even before the vaccination had been, um, you know, uh, invented the, the vaccine. So there are the, the, there's a strong anti-vaccine in France, and I suspect, I suspect Elul in many ways belongs to that. It's complicated to translate that into the language of love and caring for one another. I don't know if it's complicated, but I think I mean it's a fair question. It seems to me, look, if I'm wearing a mask in confined spaces. I'm primarily doing it for others, not for me. Um, I, you know, first off, the mask mainly protects the people uh, out, you know, the people you're surrounded by, as in it doesn't protect the filtering in so much as the sort of, you know, not spreading the virus um, if you have it asymptomatically or, 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 or otherwise, actually. So it seems to me, not that difficult to argue that it's not exactly a very loving and caring position not to care and therefore not wear a mask uh, and, you know, because I want my freedom. It's very selfish, I think. I mean, I, d I don't know where you live. Uh, we spent some time in the summer in uh, France with family when England had just gone through its Freedom Day where our dear leader had decided that uh, uh, it was time to sort of Dutch ditch uh, masks and and it was interesting. So then the language became one of encouragement. So in most sort of you know shops where you go into, they'll they'll say or trains and whatever they'll they, they they've tried a, a way of phrasing something along the lines, you know, we all have uh, our freedom to decide how, what to do, but we encourage you to wear a mask. I mean, they, they, they they've they spin it differently from one place to the next, but they're trying to encourage people to wear masks. But the majority by now don't. And so just before we left, I noticed, you know, supermarkets, you had maybe 20% not wearing masks anymore. Now it's, it's more like maybe one third still do. And that annoys me. <laughs> it annoys me because I'm thinking that's just selfish. Like you're, you might be carrying the virus. You don't know who's vulnerable around you. You don't know who's vulnerable and not coming out anymore because they can't afford getting the virus. Now, I'm lucky enough I've been vaccinated. My immediate family has as well, um, you know, and uh, because I chose to, I, I, I could have not done it. So vaccines, I think it's a bit more difficult because the vaccine is protecting yourself primarily, although by not getting it, hopefully you're not transmitting it. But it's only on mask. I, I, I think it's, it's not that far fetched to argue that it's a, a bit selfish to decide not to wear one. With vaccination, it's more complicated, but there is still an element of collective immunity, to use the term that you know, they've tried to herd immunity, the term that they've avoided ever since they conceded that that was basically what drove them at the very start here in the UK. Um, you know, the more people are protected against the virus, the less likely it is to circulate and affect others. I don't know whether I, I suppose in my context and with the people I talk to, it's not, not so much through the language of Christianity or Christian ethics that people are going to be convinced of um, getting vaccinated or not. It's the language of public health. And there's a number of things for which we rely on what to call it one word, the science. You know, when I walk on a bridge, I trust that the engineers and the science that backs them up have built it properly. Same when I go in a plane. With medicine, I'm not an expert, but I gather that the evidence is accumulating that, frankly, it's a better idea to get vaccinated for yourself as well as for others than not. And it's on that basis that I went for it. At the very start, I think like many others, I was interested to see what the studies might say, because you don't know what's in this vaccine, new technology, you know, side effects. And there are, it turns out, some side effects, but they're very rare and, you, you know, not getting vaccinated makes you much worse on those very side effects, etc. So I think it's more on the public health 
argument that I would try and, or that I try and speak to the people I speak to and to, to, to encourage them to get vaccinated rather than through the language of Christianity. But that's not to say you can't do it. I think it's a longer road there, I suspect. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we're uh, towards the end of the interview now. Um, I guess one last question that I would have is in terms of uh, people who aren't necessarily um, into theology or into academics, what are some ways that they can tap into Christian anarchism? What some, you know, gateway resources or that you would recommend or thinkers, writers, that kind of thing? I mean, it kind of depends on what you prefer. <laughs> if you're quite keen on um, you know, a version of Christianity that is not Tolstoyan, more typically Protestant, and there's all sorts of varieties, then you might be more interested in Elul, Ella, Andrews. If, um, there we go, my pen's gone. If you can cope with a Tolstoyan kind of Christianity and what you're interested in is the broader kind of critique of violence, non-violence, and, and, you know, um, then Tolstoy is definitely a great read. You, and for that matter, you can read Tolstoy even if you are of a different type of Christianity than him and still focus on what he has to say on the, on, on the Christian ethics in particular and kind of, you know, roll your eyes if you want to on the other stuff. So it's, it's still it's still a challenge, I think, to sort of read it because uh, it makes you rethink what you're doing. Uh, I, I, but then in the, in the States, of course, in particular, there's a lot of uh, Catholic worker communities uh, doing all sorts of work in, in cities in particular, um, caring, what was it, what's their expression? caring for the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable, um, <laughs> helping people like, you know, uh, people, refugees struggling with the Kafkaesque paperwork, encouraging them to go away, uh, providing food for them, demonstrating or demonstrating, uh, performing acts of liturgy to use their vocabulary sometimes on Ministry of Defense buildings and whatnot. There's all sorts of things that you can do there and get embedded in your local community, not just in the US, but, but in particular in the US with uh, Catholic workers. And then, of course, online, there's plenty. There's like loads of different things, whether it's Facebook groups, although some are getting colonized by different perspectives, let's say. Um, <laughs> or uh, all sorts of interesting podcasts. I mean, th th there's lots out there and I can't really speak for it because it, 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 there's really a lot going on. And it is, okay, heavily sort of American focused. It, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of people are uh, from North America in, in those communities, but that, that's not a problem. That's just something I, I notice is part of it. Uh, but, but that also means that you get the kind of activities and debates that you will typically get in North America, I think. So, um, yeah, and I suspect that there's a fair bit of talking about American politics in some of these four or two. So it depends what you're interested in. There's lots of books and resources. A lot of the longer books, even a lot of what Tolstoy wrote, is available for free online, uh, sort of if you know where to look. But you can Google around, try with PDF in your, in your search, as you, you'll find it. And by the way, on Tolstoy, I should say, um, not to forget it, um, it's, um, it's a guy called Steve... Heike, I think is how you just spell his name or describe it. He's, he, he did a PhD on Tolstoy at Aberdeen, which I was lucky enough to be an external examiner for, but he actually takes a rather different approach to me on Tolstoy. He reckons it is high time that we read Tolstoy as Christians because he speaks to Christians in a, in, in a way that's much less incompatible than I say uh, read it, for example. So he, he brings Tolstoy to uh, the Protestant tradition or makes him a bit more, I don't know if he makes him more comfortable, but makes the case that he's not, that he should be considered as an important thinker uh, in, 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 in the Christian story, uh, as it were. So, yeah, it kind of depends what you're interested in. Um, and I guess, okay, last thing, the, uh, the one, one, um, one chapter that I co-wrote with uh, someone called Lara Apps uh, in, in Canada, um, it's been published in three different versions now, but at least two of these, I think, are available for free online. But it's a chapter that tries to map out the literature on anarchism and religion, kind of in four categories, kind of anarchist critiques of religion, anarchist exegesis, anarchist theology, and ha anarchist historiography. So writing the histories of, anarchi of Christian religious anarchists 
individuals and communities. And that particular piece, if you Google it and find it, there's lots of references to all sorts of sources. Um, so I'm not saying read that, I'm saying jump to the bibliography or read the bits that, 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 that you're more interested in and, and pick that up and follow that trail kind of thing. Uh, might be another way of yeah, recommending things. To Great. Um, thanks for joining us and giving us an overview of the discourses in Christian anarchism, something our um, audience may be less familiar with and not sure where to get into. So that's a great start. Uh, and thanks for uh, giving us an idea of the vast complexity of the current you know, scholastic debate on it, what, how it's categorized and what it focuses on and what, what it is, which in scholarly works is always up for debate. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us, Alex. And, uh, You're very thanks, welcome, Derek. my pleasure. Thanks. And uh, thanks, Derek, for kind of co-hosting.